Uh, thanks, Nick. So uh, I'd like to, to thank the organizers, especially Roberto and Andrea, for putting together this event and uh, for inviting me to present my line of work. So, um, so as you know, in the theory of critical phenomena, there are two complementary approaches. Uh, one of them, which is central to this conference, is RG. Uh, but there is another approach, uh, conformal field theory approach, uh, which so there is the conformal field theory approach, which uh, many of you are familiar with in the two-dimensional case, but today I will focus about the recent, I will focus on the recent work uh, having to do with the three-dimensional case. So just a few words about the history. The, uh, this approach goes back to the 70s, to the work of Polakov, uh, Ferrara, Gatto, Grillo, and Mack. So this was very important work which laid formal foundations uh, of this idea, but at the time no concrete results have been obtained for various reasons. So the modern period started in 2008 when uh, I wrote this paper with Ricardo Ratazzi, Eric Tony, and Alessandro Vicky. And uh, it took a while uh, to get it really, uh, to get this idea to realize its potential. So the most impressive results were obtained only in the last couple of years. And uh, this year, uh, we founded a collaboration on the non-perturbative bootstrap with the support of the Simons Foundation. So we hope to take it even to the next level. Uh, so why do, we need, uh, why do we need yet another approach in the theory of critical phenomena? Well, there are two reasons. The reason, one is that it's a practical reason. You know, the, the reason is that the existing approaches are not really fully satisfactory. So the RG uh, is a great uh, qualitative tool to map the phase diagram, but uh, if you really want to make precision calculations, it has limitations, and uh, if you want to simulate critical phenomena, it's also hard, it's expensive, and not always conclusive. So let me just give you three examples of uh, long-standing puzzles in the theory of critical phenomena. So the first example uh, is, has to do with the measurement of the new critical exponent in liquid helium. So it's O2 model, O2 universality class. And in this case, since about 10 years, there is a eight sigma discrepancy between the best experimental measurement done on board of space shuttle and the best Monte Carlo determination of the same exponent done by theorists. And, uh, you know, th this discrepancy has been since 10 years, and RG is not able to, to tell you who is right and who is wrong. I'm being too far away, so it doesn't check. So here's a second, uh, here's a second uh, well, not puzzle, but uh, a question where it would be interesting to have more precise information. It has to do with the question of cubic anisotropy in the Heisenberg model in three dimensions. So basically, the question is whether the Heisenberg fixed point in 3D is stable with respect to the uh, cubic anisotropic perturbation. So you have, you have two fixed points, the cubic fixed point and the Heisenberg fixed point. And the question is whether the operator which drives this perturbation, which is a spin four operator with respect to O3 group, is a relevant or irrelevant perturbation of the Heisenberg fixed point. And, uh, you know, the best, it just turns out that the dimension of this operator is incredibly close to three. So at the two sigma level, by this best practical determination, it's smaller than three, but, you know, two sigma is not uh, a great deal of accuracy. And other studies indicate that actually this operator is irrelevant, so we still don't know which one of these pictures is realized. So that's my second example. And the third example is the determination of, uh, of the number of critical, uh, the critical number of Fermi species 
for which the, the three-dimensional QED flows to a um, conformal fixed point in the infrared. So in this case, uh, you know, as, as uh, this table, which I took from a recent paper, you know, you can basically pick any number between 1 and 10, and you will find it in this table. So it's really an unacceptable situation. So that was uh, the practical reason for having another approach. And then there is a conceptual, uh, conceptual reason is that, you know, on the one hand, the critical state, the critical behavior is a universal phenomenon. Uh, so the critical exponents describing this state are really fundamental constants of nature, just as fundamental as uh, pi or e or any other number in mathematics. Uh, but if you're trying to describe this critical state using the RG, we introduce a lot of non-universal bells and whistles in the process, which have to somehow disappear in the end. I mean, and it's a check that you're doing anything correctly if all this non-universal stuff doesn't matter. Uh, but, um, but that's not satisfactory in my opinion. And you know, here at this conference, people quoted Wilson and, and Feynman and uh, who else? So here's, uh, so the quotes are dangerous, but as long as they fit your narrative, they're good. So here's one which fits mine. So it's a quote from Polakov who said that a musician group is a human-made thing. It's a smart way to calculate, but it does not have a breathtaking quality of the Dirac equation. And so what, what he had in mind uh, when he said this in an interview is that we need a manifestly universal approach to the critical state, and CFT is precisely such an approach. So why CFT? Why conformal? Okay, this would take uh, another hour to explain it in great detail, but basically, so this is going to be just one transparency. So what happens is that if you have uh, a continuum field theory, which is invariant under rotation invariance, under scale invariance, as appropriate for a fixed point, and which is local, and the condition for locality uh, can be um, encoded, for example, by saying that it has a local stress tensor operator, then under these conditions, generically, uh, you will require conformal invariance in the infrared. Well, I mean, we are already in the infrared since we are imposing scale invariance. And, okay, genericity here is important. It's, uh, uh, for example, uh, genericity can be stated by requiring the existence of interactions, so it should not be a Gaussian theory. In fact, there are counterexamples to this uh, implication, but all known counterexamples are Gaussian. So as long as you are willing to take this uh, genericity assumption, then this implication is true. And so that's why uh, we can use conformal invariance. So what is a conformal field theory? So I'm going to review some basics of conformal field theory. I apologize for those uh, who know these things. So conformal field theory is, in the most uh, simple way, is just uh, a collection of local operators. It's just a list of local operators. It's generically, generally an infinite list of local operators. And for these local operators, you're allowed to compute correlation functions. You only talk about correlation functions as observables. Uh, you don't talk about actions and things like that. And these correlation functions have conformal invariance. So that's, uh, this is the most uh, basic definition of a CFT, but then, of course, there are all other properties. So uh, what, is, what do I mean by conformal invariance? So conformal invariance is invariance on the conformal transformations, which are the transformations preserving the angles. And in 2D, the group of these transformations is infinitely dimensional. Any analytic transformation has this property. In higher dimensions, it's a finite dimensional uh, group of transformations where, which consists of a uh, Poincare group, rotations, translations, and in addition, you have the dilatations and this special conformal transformation generator, which is, can be obtained from the translation generator by uh, conjugating with inversion. 
And it is this special conformer transformation generator which makes everything possible. So the crucial property of this generator which makes everything possible is that it has a negative scaling dimension. So in a normal field theory, what you can do, the only thing you can do is differentiate your local operators. And if you differentiate, then you raise the dimension of an operator by one unit. So in a conformal field theory, you get this extra operation which allows you to lower the dimension of your operator by one unit. And it is from here that a lot of formal structure of conformal field theory follows. So the local operators, uh, coming back to them, they are characterized by what? They are characterized by their spin under the rotation group. So they can be scalars, vectors under the rotation group. They can be two tensors like the stress tensor and so on. Uh, and they're characterized by their scaling dimension. So the, the scaling dimension is the one which is related to the critical exponents. Uh, but I'm going to state my results in terms of the scaling dimension because that's the natural, uh, that's the natural number for the CFT approach. And then, okay, the scaling dimension just means that an operator scales like one over x to the delta. For example, if you take the two-point function, then it's going to scale like one over x minus y to the sum of the scaling dimensions. So that's, this is the usual thing. And so what do we know about the scaling dimension? So here I'm going, going to flash uh, the latest result about the scaling dimensions of, uh, of the critical point of the easing model, uh, which have been obtained by Koss, Poland, Simmons, Duffin, and Vicky in uh, this year in, in, in the March of 2016. Uh, so, so in this plot, on the horizontal axis, uh, I have a scaling dimension of one operator present in the easing model, which is the sigma operator in the field theoretical approach that would be called phi. And on the vertical axis, I have a scaling dimension of another operator, which we call epsilon, that would be what our G people would call phi squared. And the dimensions of these operators are related to the critical exponents eight and nu. And uh, the conformal field theory techniques predict that these dimensions have to live in this tiny island, in this tiny red island. So the the dimensions of this island are given here. So th these, are, these are the numbers. Uh, so you have six significant digits in both delta sigma and delta epsilon. So what I would like to emphasize is that uh, these error bars that you have here, these are rigorous error bars. So it's a rare example of a quantum field theoretical computation where the error bars are not uh, just estimated, but they are really truly rigorous error bars. So anything outside of this range is fully excluded, just cannot happen. So these error bars are about uh, factor 2550, okay, depending on which of the two you're looking at, are better than the best Monte Carlo determination of these critical exponents made by Heisenbusch in 2010. And uh, as far as, to the best of my knowledge, it's about three orders of magnitude better than the best compatible renormalization group calculation. So what I mean by compatible renormalization group calculation is that, uh, you know, you often see people doing an RG calculation and then they compute you 10 digits which follow from, I don't know, LPA approximation or anything like that because they can, but they don't estimate in systematic error which follows from their approximation. And very often, these results are incompatible with what we now know are the exact values of this, not the exact, but the most precise values of this exponent. So if you exclude those results which are incompatible, so they are wrong, then the, the best result which is not wrong is a thousand times larger error bar. So that's, where, that's uh, the purpose of my talk will be to try to explain how do we get these numbers.
So just uh, a few more words about, about the, the CFT. So I mentioned already the importance of the scaling dimensions and uh, that they determine the two-point functions of, of operators. Here I want to say uh, uh, one more thing about the two-point function. So it's, it's a consequence of the CFT magic of the existence of this uh, operator KMU, the special conformal generator, that actually uh, you can show that the two-point function of of, of uh, these operators is not only, not only does it scale like one over X minus Y to the scaling dimension, but actually it's diagonal, meaning that the operator has a two point function only with itself. Uh, that's why I have this delta IJ here. And also it's not just proportional to this power, but the whole uh, structure here, which is a, is a spin dependent tensor structure is fixed by conformal invariance. So, okay, if you have a scalar, then it's just one. Uh, if you have uh, a, a vector of the Lorentz group, then it's uh, delta mu minus two x mu x nu over x squared. So it's fixed. Well, this is true for the so-called primary operators, which are, uh, you know, in conformal field theory, divide the operators into primaries and their derivatives. So basically, the, this is true for the operators that you have to worry about because all the other operators are derivatives of those. Okay, so once you are done with scaling operators, the next thing that, uh, that we have to bring into the discussion is the operator product expansion. So of course, uh, uh, I'm sure that everyone is familiar with OPE in, in quantum field theory. So in conformal field theory, OPE has some features which are similar to the usual, to the normal QFTs, but it, it is much more powerful than it is in the usual QFT. So let me, let me say a few words about that. So by OPE, we mean the same thing. So we have an endpoint function of some, a bunch of local operators, and let me take here A1 and put it at zero, and A2 to put it at X, and then there are some other operators in this endpoint function. And then I can replace uh, the product of these two operators, A1, A2, by an infinite sum, which includes what? First of all, it includes, uh, it's an infinite sum over local operators, which can appear in this OP. So here is this AK of zero. So these operators, they are multiplied. First of all, they are multiplied by this factor, one over X to the delta one plus delta two minus delta K, which just follows from the dimensional analysis. They are multiplied by this OPE coefficient, C1 to K, which is just a pure number, which characterizes our conformal field theory. And an important thing is that when an operator appears in the OPE, then its derivatives, so del mu AK, del mu del mu AK, they also appear in the OPE. Okay, for dimensional reasons, they are multiplied by X mu, X mu, X mu, and so on. But a very important property of conformal field theories is that the coefficients of these operators, they are fixed by conformal symmetry. So the only thing that you have to specify is this overall coefficients and everything else is fixed. So this is of course uh, very particular for CFTs. So in a, in, if you take any other uh, conformal, in any, any other quantum field theory like, like QCD, for example, then OPE is also valid in QCD, but it's not true that the coefficients with which the derivative operators appear, they are related in a simple way to the coefficients of the leading operators. There you have to do a separate computation for them. So here you don't have to do a separate computation. So that's one very important difference. Okay, so once you have this OPE, uh, you can reduce the endpoint functions to n minus one point functions and so on, and you, you can keep going and you reduce it to the two point functions, which are fixed, as I said. And so this shows that at least formally, if we know the dimensions and spins of all local operators of your conformal field theory, and if we know the OPE coefficients, then we can compute everything. We can compute all correlation functions, we can, and so we can compute all the observables. So these numbers, because they're so important, they're called CFT data. And to solve a conformal field theory means to compute 
the CFT data. So from the CFT point of view, the OPE coefficients are just as fundamental as the scaling dimensions of the operators. This is very different from the point of view that uh, RG approach is taking. So in the RG, uh, in the RG papers, there's a lot of discussion about the scaling dimension of operators and the critical exponents, but there's hardly any discussion about the OPE coefficients. So this is because they don't seem to play such a central role, and also because they are much harder to compute. So even, even though we know that they, they exist, uh, people don't bother to discuss them, they don't bother to compute them. So in the conformal field theory approach to critical phenomena, they go hand in hand. You cannot determine the scaling dimensions of operators without determining the OPE coefficients, and vice versa. And in fact, you know, I showed you the results from CFT for the scaling dimensions of the operators sigma and epsilon, but we have results also for the OPE coefficients of these operators, which are of comparable accuracy. So this, for example, the OPE coefficient of for epsilon to appear in the OPE sigma times sigma is this, and the OPE coefficients for epsilon to appear in the OPE epsilon times epsilon is this. As you see, it's again with the order six digits of precision, and these numbers are, you know, here just for comparison, this would be the numbers in, uh, in free theory in three dimensions, square root two, square root two. So these are, of course, not, not at all, uh, they don't, very different from these free theory numbers. Okay, so uh, now uh, another uh, difference from normal field theory that I would like to stress, which makes OP particularly powerful in conformal field theories, is that it's not just an asymptotic expansion. So in normal quantum field theory, often we discuss OPE and we say, well, OPE just determines for us the the leading asymptotic behavior of a correlation function when points come close to each other. Uh, but in conformal field theory, much more is true. So it's not just the leading asymptotic behavior. It's actually mathematically convergent power series expansion with a finite radius of convergence. So let me discuss, let me, let me describe this result. So, so suppose you have uh, an endpoint function in conformal field theory where you have two operators, A1 and A2. Okay, this is some sphere which surrounds them and of radius R. And suppose that all other operators in this correlation function, they are inserted outside of this sphere. So let's just pick the sphere in such a way where all operators are inserted at a, at a larger radius. Then the following theorem is true. So first of all, OPE converges. So if X uh, stands uh, inside the sphere, then it's a really mathematically convergent power series. And moreover, you can estimate the error that you make by, by, by uh, uh, truncating the OPE. So the OPE, in the OPE, you naturally can order terms in the order of increasing scaling dimension. And then you can ask, what happens if I only include in the OPE terms corresponding to operators of scaling dimension less than a certain cutoff? What happens? Well, then you can prove a theorem that the error in the correlation function that you, uh, that you make by doing this scales like the ratio of x over r to the power of the cutoff. So this means that, for example, if you stay within half radius of the sphere, then the accuracy you obtain is exponential. So if you, if you truncate, if you take, and if you drop all the operators of dimension larger than 10, then you obtain the accuracy uh, one over two to the 10, and so on. So this, of course, we don't have theorems of this sort in non-conformal field theories. They might be true, but we don't know if this is true or not. And so, and so this question, this property of OP convergence in conformal field theory, it plays the role, it plays a rigorous counterpart of the property between the, of the decoupling of low energy modes and high energy modes in normal quantum field theories. So low dimension operators are like low energy modes. And you know, if you drop high energy modes, if you drop 
high dimension operators, then you don't commit such a big error, actually. So the, you know rigorously what is the error that you commit. And this is very, very useful. So now we come uh, to, the crucial, uh, to the crucial point is that, okay, so I told you that if you know the, the CFT data, if you know the scaling dimensions, and if you know the peak coefficients, then you can compute everything with CFT. So now the question becomes, uh, does any set of scaling dimensions and OP coefficients define a consistent conformal field theory? The question is no. The answer is no. The answer is no. And the consistency condition that we still have to discuss is known as OP associativity. So, uh, so in the mathematical language, suppose you have three operators, AI, AJ, AK, so associativity means that if you take an operator product of the first two operators, you obtain an OPE series, and then if you take a product of OPE product of each operators in the series with AK, then you will get the same answer, you should get the same answer, if you were to do this product in the opposite order. So this may sound as a mathematical condition, so where does this follow from? Well, this follows from the requirement that the correlation functions in your theory are unique. So for example, let's look at the four-point function. So this, this is an equivalent formulation for the associativity, which is known sometimes as a bootstrap equation for the four-point function or crossing condition on the four-point function. So you take a four-point function, a1, a2, a3, a4, and using the OPE, we can take the OPE of operators a1 and a2, and A3 and A4, and we can express uh, this four-point function as a sum over operators exchanged in this S channel by using this OPE. So by, by the way, these are not Feynman diagrams. These diagrams, they encode for you the order in which you are doing the OPE. Or you can do the same computation in another order. You can take the OPE of one and four, uh, two and three, of course, you have to be careful uh, to pick a configuration of points in such a way that both of these OPEs are convergent, but I gave you the condition for the convergence of the OPE in terms of this sphere, which should include points and should not include other points. So using that condition, you can show that these two expansions, they do have overlapping radius of convergence, so everything, everything is mathematically well-defined. And then, since it's the same four-point function, you have to impose that these two expansions agree and this gives you a condition which is, you know, since you are using the OPE two times, it gives you a condition which is quadratic in, uh, in the OPE coefficient. So it's C1 to K, C3 for K times something, some kinematical factors which come from all these two-point functions and OPE coefficients and so on, uh, has to be equal to the sum done in the opposite order. So, uh, so it's, it's easy to convince yourself that if you take this uh, bootstrap condition for four-point functions and if you impose it for all possible four-point functions of the theory, then this is equivalent, this is fully equivalent to imposing the OPE associativity condition that I mentioned in the previous slide. So in practice, we actually work with this condition. Okay, so... Uh, second and last slide of history. So these bootstrap equations, as I described them, they were first introduced in the 70s, as I said. And uh, at the time, uh, it was already understood pretty much that they, these equations are non-perturbative, that they are manifestly uh, universal, they are manifestly universal, and that they are mathematically well-defined. But what was not, uh, what, was, what scared a little bit people at the time is that uh, this is an infinite number of equations for an infinite number of unknowns, and uh, it was not fully understood how to find your way in this infinity, in this uh, forest of infinity, even though it is mathematically well-defined. So there's nothing, uh, it's not the sort of infinities that uh, usually are encountered in perturbative quantum field theories. But then uh, there, was a, there was a breakthrough in 83 in the famous paper of Belay and Polikov and Zemolochikov who found, who realized that in the two-dimensional setting, 
uh, sometimes you can find uh, conformal field theories which only have a finite number of primary operators. And so for the, you know, by, by doing precisely the same uh, analysis, precisely the same bootstrap equations, but in the two-dimensional setting, they found uh, finite dimensional solutions of these equations. And this was the breakthrough of the two-dimensional conformal field theory. Uh, so, uh, but it was still not known what to do in the higher dimensional case where the number of operators is necessarily infinite. And so that's, that's when uh, we started doing the progress starting in 2008. Uh, and uh, the reason we achieved the progress was uh, uh, thanks to numerical techniques. So we know, we said, well, sure, okay, the number of operators are infinite, but uh, we are not afraid of infinitely many operators. We, we still do know that these expansions converge. So if you keep lots of operators, if you keep hundreds of operators or thousands of operators, the error that you are going to make is going to be e to the minus 1,000, e to the minus 100. So this is a very small error, and uh, we should not worry about it. So that's, that's why we achieved progress. So what can we do? Well, we can construct using our numerical algorithms very precise, arbitrarily precise uh, numerical solutions, approximate solutions to crossing, to these crossing equations. So they can be arbitrarily precise. Okay, if you want 100 digits, we can construct you, uh, we can give you a spectrum which satisfies crossing up to 10 to the minus 100 accuracy. So that's one thing. Uh, and another thing is that we can, uh, we can prove, so in many cases we can prove uh, using our numerical techniques that uh, in certain regions of CFT parameter space, solution is just impossible. You can prove it numerically but rigorously that certain chunks of CFT parameter space are inconsistent. So we can just rule out huge chunks of CFT parameter space. So, uh, so let me just, uh, uh, using the, the three-dimensional easing model as an example, to show you what a typical uh, bootstrap analysis looks like. So which steps do you have to go through uh, in order to bootstrap your, uh, your favorite CFT? So first of all, given a CFT, given a universality class, so the, the one most important characteristic thing of this universality class is the global symmetry. So in the case of, uh, of the easing model, it's Z2. So you already know that you should all your local operators, all local operators of a CFT are going to be classified by representations of the global symmetry. So in case of the Z of the easing model, these are going to be Z2 operators and the Z2 odd operators, Z2 even and Z2 odd operators. Uh, so that's something that you know a priori. Mm, but you know also something else. It also makes sense to characterize universality classes by the number of relevant operators that they have. So you have critical theories, you have pre-critical theories, multi-critical theories, and so on. So in the case of the three-dimensional easing model, we know it's a robust fact, it's a robust experimental fact that uh, it contains two and only two relevant scalar operators. Okay, the fact that it contains one relevant Z2 even operator, it's, uh, it's extremely well known. It just follows from the fact that in order to, to reach the, the phase transition, you have to fine tune only one parameter, temperature. But the fact that it only has one Z2 odd relevant operator is also well known. It follows from the fact that uh, the phase diagram of uh, water, of the liquid vapor phase transition, is two dimensional. So it's a two-dimensional, is a pressure and temperature. And in that case, the Z2 symmetry is emergent. And since it's emergent, we know that the total number of relevant scalars has to be equal to exactly two. And so the, the other one has to be Z2 odd. So we, we, can, we, can define, we can define the three-dimensional easing model universality class as uh, a three-dimensional CFT, which has Z2 global symmetry and precisely one Z to odd even and then Z to odd, 
the two odd uh, relevant scalar operator. And so, uh, well, there's also another condition that uh, there should be a local stress tensor operator, as I said, with this locality. And then, okay, so, so you say, I have my operator sigma and epsilon, let me, let me consider their operator product expansion. What do I know about this operator product expansion? So if I take the OP of sigma times sigma, it, it's going to contain, in general, all the two even operators of the theory, which are of even spin, even because of the, of the symmetry which interchanges these two operators. And so what are these operators? Well, for example, the operator epsilon will appear in this OP, uh, but there are going to be also infinitely many, infinitely many uh, other scalar operators. So in the usual field theoretic approach, you would call these operators uh, phi to the six, phi, phi to the four, phi to the six, and so on. You would invent some names for them, uh, which include the field and its derivatives and so on. So in, in conformal field theory, you don't do that. So it, it makes no sense to give such names to these operators. So you just call them with some labels, epsilon prime. So for, for what we call epsilon prime would, for RG people, would be phi to the fourth. And what you know about epsilon prime is that it's irrelevant. So epsilon is the only relevant scalar, and this guy is irrelevant. And you can impose this as a condition on your CFT, that this operator, you don't know what its dimension is going to be, but it's irrelevant. That's something that you know. Then you have a spin two sector. In this, you have a stress tensor operator, but it's not the only operator in the spin two sector. There's going to be some other guy of high dimension, let's call it T prime. You just invent some names for them. It doesn't really matter. So this is the sigma times sigma OP. Epsilon times epsilon OP is going to contain the same operators, but with different OP coefficients. So this is interesting because now, you know, the conditions that the dimensions of operators in this OP and in this OP are the same uh, is not such an obvious condition. So you can expect that if you were to impose it, you would get some constraining power. Finally, if you take the OP of sigma times epsilon, it will contain sigma. The next scalar is going to be sigma prime. So this is something that, that RG would call phi to the fifth. We know, in CFT, you don't call it phi to the fifth, you say it's an irrelevant scalar. But there are more things that you can impose. So OP coefficients, you can impose that the OP coefficients are symmetric. So this is a consequence of conformal invariance. So the OP of sigma times sigma contains epsilon. So there is this OP coefficient sigma, sigma, epsilon. But if you take the OP of epsilon times sigma, the OP coefficient with which sigma occurs in this OP is equal to the first OP coefficient. So the, the OP coefficients are fully symmetric in IJK. So that's something that you uh, can impose very easily when you do the conformal bootstrap calculations. Another thing that you can impose is that the OP coefficient of the stress tensor is fixed by the word identity. So for any scalar operator O, well, scalar or not scalar, O can be here, sigma can be epsilon, can be anything, the OP coefficient of the stress tensor, appropriately normalized, is going to be given by the dimension of O divided by a square root of a certain number which is the three-dimensional analog of the central charge. So you see, by fixing just one number, you fix the OPE coefficients with which stress tensor appears in the OPE of any operator with itself. So that's, of course, very powerful. Unitarity plays a role. So we know that uh, there are many interesting uh, universality classes which are described by unitary uh, or reflection-positive quantum field theories, and so they would correspond to unitary uh, CFTs. So in that case, you can say something about the OPE coefficients. You can say that the OPE coefficients are going to be necessarily real. And you can also say something about the scaling dimensions of the operators. So they, you can say that they are going to be bounded from below by certain numbers. And these numbers are, are called unitarity bounds. So these are basically uh, the lowest dimensions uh, which are which occur in free theory. 
So th this dimension is delta minus 2 over 2 is the dimension of the free scalar. And then in any unitary CFT, the dimension of all scalar operators has to be above this bound. So these are some rigorous results following from unitarity. So since you know this, you have to impose this. And then, OK, so how does the workflow go? So our goal is uh, to determine uh, the, the low delta, the, the low CFT delta. By this I mean, I mean, we cannot possibly hope to determine the dimensions and OPE coefficients of all operators of the theory because there are infinitely many of them. But modestly, you can start by saying, well, I would like to determine the dimensions and OPE coefficients of the operators of low scaling dimension. So this is what I call low CFT de de data. For example, in the, in the easing model, you might want uh, to determine the dimensions and OPE coefficients of the operator sigma epsilon and say the leading, uh, the leading irrelevant scalars in each sector, in the Z2-odd and Z2-even sector. So, so you say, okay, this is something that I would like to do. Then the first thing you do is that you pick a set of four-point functions, which include the operators you are interested in, uh, either as external operators or as operators which are exchanged when you do P. So for example, here you, can, you might want to choose the correlation function sigma, 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 sigma. So sigma occurs now as an external operator, but then epsilon occurs as an internal operator because there is an OPE sigma times sigma gives you epsilon. So you will have access to epsilon through the OPE. Alternatively, if you want to achieve even higher precision, then you will do the analysis including epsilon also as an external operator. You will say, okay, now I'm going to include also four point functions where epsilon is, occurs as an external operator. Then, uh, if you do this, then for example, in the OPE sigma times epsilon, you will have access to the operator sigma prime, which is something that you did not have access to if you were just studying this correlation function. So the, obviously, the more correlation functions you can, you can control, you can add, uh, the better your accuracy is going to be. So for, for the considered four-point functions, you, you take the OPE expansion in all possible channels. And you divide this OPE expansion into operators, exchange the operators which are low, and those are the ones they're interested in, and the high operators. So you don't care so much about the high operators. So you want to marginalize over the high operators. But, so the, the, the game is, you would like to know, given the low operators, can you find high operators in such a way that the crossing equation is satisfied? If you can, well, then it means that uh, the low operator scaling dimensions, the peak coefficients that you, for example, fixed uh, are allowed, or at least you cannot rule them out. If, on the other hand, you can prove rigorously that no matter what you can do, the high operators cannot uh, satisfy, cannot help you satisfy crossing, well, it means that you ruled out that part of, of the parameter space. That's, uh, that's the game. And so in this plot that I already showed you before uh, about the scaling dimensions of the easing model, so that's precisely what we did. So in this, uh, all this white region we, is excluded because so in this plot, it was fixed. So the dimension of the operator sigma was fixed. The dimension of epsilon was fixed. It was imposed that these are the only two relevant scalar operators. And it was found that for every point outside this region, it was found that the irrelevant operators cannot, you know, you, you, you put sigma and epsilon. Sigma and epsilon by themselves do not satisfy crossing. Actually, you can show that uh, in, in high dimensions, you can only satisfy crossing if the number of operators that you exchange is infinite. So certainly, if you just include sigma and epsilon and you only exchange sigma and epsilon, you will not be able to satisfy crossing. 
But you can ask, uh, can you satisfy crossing with the help of, of irrelevant operators? Without assuming anything about them, except for the fact that they are irrelevant. And then, lo and behold, for every point here, you can show that this is impossible. You cannot, there is no solution to crossing. Now, is this surprising? You may say, well, uh, you know, at which point uh, do, do, do we have to be surprised? Well, at this point, I would not yet be so surprised. Uh, it's not surprising that by doing this, by, by applying this method, you can rule out chunks of the CFT parameter space. I mean, it was, in a sense, it's surprising that it was not done earlier. It was not done before we got around uh, to do this. Because basically what, is ha what happens is that these exclusions, they follow from positivity. So I mentioned to you that the, the, the OP coefficients in unitary theories are real. So these, uh, these crossing equations, they involve the quadratic and OP coefficients. So in, in the simplest cases, they just involve just squares of OP coefficients, which are positive numbers. And so these exclusions, they just follow from positivity in a certain sense. I mean, I put positivity in, uh, in quotation marks. So what happens is that if the law operators, they violate crossing symmetry by a certain amount, uh, then a certain positive amount, then the high operators cannot undo this. Now, but what does it mean positive? Because we are doing, we are working in a very, uh, in a very multi-dimensional uh, functional space, if you wish, because we are dealing with the space of functions. So what you mean by positivity is not really clear. And the role of our algorithms uh, that we developed is, uh, is precisely to identify which directions are positive and they give you interesting constraints and which directions are not, you know, are not particularly useful, useful. And so this is something that I cannot possibly explain in, uh, in the limited time, but the key words here uh, are linear programming and semi-definite programming. So these are the algorithms that, that we are using to do, to identify this positive quote unquote directions. Okay, so, so the fact that the constraints exist is not so surprising. What is however surprising is how strong they are. So this is something that could not, could not a priori be uh, foreseen before we did these calculations. So, uh, so this is something that amounts to, to a discovery, uh, that by just putting together constraints from a handful of four-point functions, you know, as I, you know, the plot that I showed you, it included the just three correlation functions in the analysis, sigma, 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 epsilon, epsilon, and epsilon, 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 you get such a tremendous constraining power and you get these tiny islands in the parameter space which basically points, uh, which tell you that the three-dimensional easing model CFT is basically uniquely fixed. So why exactly this happens is an open problem. Uh, it might signal that, in fact, the three-dimensional easing CFT is exactly solvable. Uh, it might signal something else, but uh, I don't think anyone has any good idea about what precisely is happening. So this is a, an interesting thing to think about. Going back to this plot, by using the same algorithm, uh, which in the white region tells us that the solution does not exist, in the shaded region, the same algorithm gives us a solution. So you run the algorithm and it spits out for you a very, very precise solution to crossing symmetry in this region. This solution is not unique. So if you run the algorithm two times, you might get a slightly different solution. If you vary around this region, the allowed region, your solution will vary a little bit, but it will vary by a tiny amount. So this is how we estimate our errors. So you know the, the, the fact that the fact that certain numbers that we give, uh, you know, they, they change in the sixth or seventh digit. It's because the solution uh, varies a little bit when we when we go inside this region. And so, in particular, uh, you know, here is a, 
a synthesis of everything that we know about the operator algebra of the three-dimensional Ising model. So we know the dimensions of, of a bunch of operators. Of, we know more, but okay, these are the ones that fit on the slide, and we know their peak coefficients, and we know the center of charge. In particular, we know the dimension of the leading irrelevant z-even scalar, the leading irrelevant z-odd scalar, and we know We know many more things that people ever bothered to discuss in, in their G approach, and in particular, the OP coefficients that nobody ever bothered to discuss. So if you've been following, if you've been following this line of development a little bit, then you may notice that <coughs> the results are getting more precise, thank you, uh, with time. Uh, why is this happening? Well, it's happening because uh, we, we keep adding more constraints. So, for example, before we were using uh, just one correlation function, now we can use three correlation functions, and okay, in a couple of years we'll use five correlation functions and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, so that's one reason for increasing uh, constraining power. Another reason is that even if you include a single four-point function in the, in the analysis, then this bootstrap condition is a functional equation because it has to be satisfied for any positions of the operators, x1, x2, x3, x4. And so in principle, even a single equation contains infinitely many constraints. And so in any numerical analysis, you pick out, out of these infinitely many constraints, a finite subset. And this subset also, you know, as the algorithms improve, this subset increases, and so constraining power improves. So the, these numbers that we quoted uh, if, uh, if you turn the crank a bit longer, we can easily get one, two, three more digits. So, so in this sense, uh, really, uh, the easing model, at least from the numerical point of view, uh, the three-dimensional easing model is solved um, at the critical point. It's an invitation for people to think about perhaps uh, an analytic solution, but numerically, uh, it's in good shape. So what do you do next? Turning the crank and obtaining a few more digits is perhaps uh, not so interesting, perhaps only to make the point, uh, but uh, it's more interesting that the same method can be applied to other universality classes with a small number of relevant operators because that was the thing which was important, which allowed us to control the easing mode so well because there are only two relevant operators in the game. But there are many other universality classes which share the same property. So the ON model, the gross niveau model, and uh, even the, the QED3, they all have this property. And so the work has already started to extend this method to, to these other models. And so one nice thing, for example, about the ON models is that the same islands that I showed you for, the same island that I showed you for the easing model, it exists also for the ON models. So, uh, by, by performing exactly the same type of analysis, you find that, uh, okay, this, is, this plot is already a bit old, now there are better, smaller islands, but it's true that also ON models live in islands and you, you can control these islands up to very large N where one over N expansion, you can compare to one over N expansion. And so th this plot shows you uh, very clearly how this approach can lead to a numerical classification of conformal field theories. You know, here, you make a single plot and you see, okay, that there is actually a family of conformal field theories living here. <coughs> I mentioned this puzzle about the discrepancy, eight sigma discrepancy for the two model. Well, this puzzle is also on the way to be solved and the winner are the theoreticians. Uh, seems to be. So, uh, so these are the rigorous islands uh, for the O2 model. And you see that this is the theoretical determination from Monte Carlo. You see that for the O2 model, the Monte Carlo is still better, it's still more precise than the bootstrap. Uh, but you can also see that the experimental error bars here, uh, they are on the way to be excluded by, by the bootstrap analysis. So in this case, uh, the bootstrap is not, yet, uh, is not yet more precise than Monte Carlo, but at least it's been able to distinguish who is right and who is wrong. And so uh, 
what what so this brings me to the uh, to the name of my seminar so the the CFT genome project so uh, what I was trying to convince you is that uh, is that uh, the the scaling dimensions and and the peak coefficients of the conformal field theory are its genome. So these are the most fundamental parameters uh, which uh, characterize any conformal field theory. And just, uh, just as the, the two spirals of the genome are intertwined in the same way the scaling dimensions and the peak coefficients are intertwined and you cannot think efficiently about one without thinking about the, the other. And uh, so, so what, uh, uh, what this leads to is a, is a project of classifying three-dimensional universality classes based on this language. Uh, it's, it's not a simple task, so it's, um, it's definitely not just an automatic extension of what has been done so far, so this is going to be a, a challenging project, but it's... Uh, the work has already started, and uh, you know, you, I, I'm sure that on the scale of five years or so, uh, we will get uh, uh, we will get a much clearer picture about the three-dimensional universality classes uh, than uh, based from the CFT approach than what we have now. Thank you. <laughs>